everyone. I'm Dr. Queen Sarkar, and our guest today is a shining literary star, Professor Nandini Sahu. Mm -hmm. Professor Nandini Sahu is a major voice in contemporary Indian English literature. She has accomplished her doctorate in English literature under the tutelage of eminent poet and academic, late Professor Niranjan Mohanty from Vishwabharti Shantiniketan. Professor Nandini's creative output has been widely published in India, USA, UK, Africa, and Pakistan. And apart from the numerous, you know, other literary awards, she is a triple medalist, gold medalist in English literature. She has received the gold medal from the Honorable Vice President of India for her contribution to English studies in India in the year 2019. Professor Sahu is the author and editor of 14 books, including The Other Voice, The Silence, The Post Colonial Space, Writing the Self and the Nation, Silver Poems on My Lips, Folklore and Alternative Modernities, Volume 1 and 2, Shufama, and other poems, Swarnarekha, Sita, Dynamics of Children Literature, Zero Point, and Selected Poem of Nandini Sahu, published from New Delhi. Presently, she is the director of the School of Foreign Languages and professor of English at Indira Gandhi National Open University, New Delhi. And in today's session, we would be talking about Professor Nandini Sahu's much discussed poem, Sita. But before that, I would like to welcome you to TYMS Academy, ma'am. It is indeed a pleasure to have you with us today. Thank you, Dr. Queen. Uh, I, I feel honored to be a part of this discussion. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you so much, ma'am. So, uh, to begin with, I mean, uh, Sita is, uh, I mean, one of the defining figures of uh, Indian womanhood, yet there is no single version of her story. I mean, uh, different accounts uh, of Sita coexist in myth, literature, and folk tales. Could you please introduce us to your Sita? Thank you, Queen. Uh, well, this is the book, as you can see, and uh, holding the book. Uh, it's, it was published in 2015 originally, and then uh, three more uh, editions have already come. And uh, as you, I think you might be already knowing that a couple of universities also have introduced Sita in their MA uh, syllabi. And uh, this year the book has been translated to Hindi and it has been published from Pandulipi Prakashan from Delhi. It just happened uh, 10 days back, so it's another good news uh, to share with you all. Uh, so, uh, thank you so much for initiating this discussion. Sita is close to my heart. I, I live Sita when uh, I read and write this poem. So, uh, Sita, it's my maiden venture into the long narrative genre. Before Sita, I had so many other poetry collections, but uh, this is the first poetry collection where one particular character has been taken. Character mm -hmm. Sita from Mayana has been taken and she has been deconstructed and has been placed vis-a-vis -vis as contemporary women. And uh, mythology and folklore, they always have uh, been the background to most of my poems. Uh, so it's Sita, but this is my first venture into long narrative poem. And uh, the subject takes off from our epic traditions and uh, the discourse takes me much further. And uh, the poet, thinker, eco-feminist in this book, Sita, she, mm -hmm. uh, she feels that, uh, you know, uh, that she is connected to uh, planet Earth in an eco-feministic way. And uh, the text has come about when I'm convinced that my thoughts regarding Sita uh, we're ready to come out in the form of a long poem. And uh, let me tell you, Sita, this poem, it's in no way a retelling of that Ramayana. I'm not trying mm -hmm. to retell the entire story. I have mm -hmm. taken in bits and pieces, and uh, it's, it's not a retelling, but uh, just parts of Ramayana. Uh, mm -hmm. and, you know, in, in the Ramayana, there are so many Kandas, Bal Kanda, yes. Ayodhya Kanda, and Aranya Kanda, and Kishkindya Kanda, and Sundar Kanda. Yuddha Khand and Uttara Khand. I have taken parts from each of uh, the Khands, like the stories related to Sita's life. And uh, there are a little more than uh, 300 versions of uh, the Ramayana yes. written for centuries since, says Valmiki, first wrote it. And I read almost all of them before writing this uh, poetry book. 
uh, I did research for uh, more than two years. I visited places. I tried to cover a lot of parts of uh, the, uh, the Ramayana map of the world. I tried to go to all those cities, take interviews with people, have discussions with them. Mostly I read a lot of folk Ramayans. And then okay. finally I took 18 days to write this long poem. I wow. locked myself inside uh, my study and then I took uh, 18 days to write the poem, but the research was too much. I took more than two years to do the research. You know, Sita has always been with me. Sometimes in my memory, my childhood memories, sometimes fueling my mind, my thought and action. In that sense, as I told you, that uh, it is one of my most ambitious and enduring eco-feministic poems. And uh, it's one long poem, one complete book and 120 pages. It's presented in 25 cantos or sections. And uh, the narrative of my life has taken shape in Sita, uh, like a photograph in a dark room. When I wrote Sita, I actually lived Sita. That's, that's really wonderful, ma'am. And uh, truly speak, speaking, when you, uh, when I read your Sita, I, I feel that, you know, you, you have that natural prowess and elegance with which you literally add life to your verses. And, uh, you know, with Sita, you have made this dense and obscure narrative uh, truly accessible to urban India. And you have also shown the relevance of Indian mythology at the workplace. I mean, why is it important? to be purposeful and how looking inward uh, must balance the conquest of the outside world. But can we consider Sita as uh, uh, academic poetry? I mean, is Nandini the maker of Sita, a poet uh, of her community or she is uh, a poet of the institution or this university thing? Okay, thank you for asking this question. Uh, in fact, uh, I expected this question uh, because uh, I'm not just a poet, I'm a poet, teacher, academician. I have been teaching literature since last 20 years, a little more mm -hmm. than that. And, uh, definitely uh, my theory classes uh, influence my creative writing and my creative writing influences my theory classes, isn't it? So in the contemporary culture of distraction, you know, I'm mm -hmm. quoting Munro, culture of distraction, uh, the long-standing division between theory and poetry is thinning down. After all, uh, a contemporary poet doesn't live in a limited world, totally cut off from the currents of ideas that keep penetrating the intimate and private corners of his or herself, isn't it? In such a scenario of intellectual information explosion, poetry is far from being simply a, an emotional overflow of our feelings. In some measure, poetry mm -hmm. tends to be responsible or a response to contemporary theory or theories. So this poetry theory symbiosis, it generates a discourse in which the virtual and the real, the abstract and the concrete, the theory and the praxis, they are interlocked in a dialectical manner. So it happens in my poetry as well. Theory influences poetry. Poetry takes on the sophistication of theory for uh, university poets. Mm -hmm. The shadow poetry is remarkable over contemporary Indian poetry. Now I'll go to Indian poetry in English. And at times it becomes too conspicuous to be brushed aside as mere, you know, unconscious presence. Theory goes to our classrooms. Theory goes to our creative writing. And uh, since many of the contemporary practitioners of responsible poetry, which I call witness literature, in another lecture, I was talking about witness literature. So, you know, in the court of law, the role of the witness is very important. He can actually change the case. Yeah. Similarly, in the, role, in the social change, the role of a writer is very important. The writers can be responsible and they can create witness literature or social mobility literature, which can actually change the society. And uh, it happens to the academicians that they live in the hub of critical theory, emanating primarily from the sophisticated first world countries, isn't it? So teaching theory in the classroom and writing poetry to disparate, mutually incompatible activities, they come together. So when you are a community or she is the poet of the institution or university, I am reminded of the university wits of the pre-Elizabethan period of English literature. Didn't they have any, a very major contribution to the making of Elizabethan literature? Similarly, university has a major contribution on us. That is another larger question. So to answer to your questions, has university dislocated the community at the site of poetry? No. So in that sense, 
poetry influences theory and theory influences poetry. So Nandini is a combination of a theorist, critic, poet and teacher. That's, that's, that's lovely, ma'am. But, you know, as you mentioned, you know, uh, this witness literature, as you also mentioned about, you know, the, the mobility of, you know, the text, the literature, we somehow also see that the canonical text uh, defy Sita with uh, uh, regional, very, uh, I mean, defy Sita, whereas the regional variations humanize her. Now, folk songs and ballads connect her timeless predicaments to the daily life of the rural women, but uh, the modern day women continue to see themselves reflected in films, serials, or, you know, uh, the operas based on Sita's narrative. But your proximity of Sita clearly links into various folk narratives, uh, which is evident in several cantos, as I have already mentioned. Uh, could you please give us some idea of your association with the folklore and myth in the making of Sita? Yeah, Dr. Queen, I'm glad that you asked this question to me. You know, uh, I'm a folklorist and uh, I'm proudly so. Uh, when I joined Indira Gandhi National Open University in 2006 as a reader in English, uh, long back I joined this university. And uh, then we have to do a need assessment survey of the existing academic courses and what kind of programs and courses need to be introduced. So at that time, I did the need assessment survey of uh, folklore and culture. We had all kinds of courses in the university, like American, British literature, Australian literature, and all sorts of literature, very important courses we had in our MA English and BA English. But we did not have this uh, folklore and culture studies with us. So uh, after the need assessment survey, I got to know that the, the readers and the students are eagerly looking forward to these kind of academic programs in the universities. Now you can mm -hmm. see also that this net has introduced folklore as a part of uh, their subjects, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So in 2009, I launched a diploma program in uh, PG diploma, and uh, it was a PG diploma program in folklore and culture studies, mm -hmm. and a uh, lot of takers are there. And uh, in 2018, I introduced uh, MAG 16 uh, as a part of my uh, syllabus, MA English, and mm -hmm. uh, Indian folklore. So our MA English has uh, more than 10,000 students and almost all the students are going for this particular course. So you know, folklore is very much there in our academic programs and courses and folklore has in influenced me a lot. I grew up in, in a rural village in Orissa. It's, mm -hmm. it's a tribal district. So uh, we grew up with uh, the people, the indigenous people, their simplicity, their lifestyles, and uh, we had close family associations with them. So one of my books was Sukoma and other poems, where yeah. Sukoma is a drunk woman. Yeah, so she, she was our virtual mother. Now Sita is one step forward. When I wrote Sita, I read so many folk Ramayans. And uh, I write poetry that imbibes and inherits the Daisy and the Margi. You know, the yes. elite and the yes. folk together. So the yes. two variants yes. real uh, they became, uh, you know, the self-reflexive and uh, poetry in me, you know, by using tools and concepts from the latest theories of post-colonialism, post-structuralism, new historicism and cultural poetics, I undertook a rigorous analysis of uh, Sita in terms of the shifting locations, multi stranded intertextuality, political biases and poetic sensed me in the making of my Sita. My poetic practice derives its structural strength from the narratives available to me from various oral folk traditions. I ended up reading many of the Ramayans as I told you and uh, they lend me a grammar of arranging my complex and ironic poetic arguments. I got the grammar from folklore. Moreover, it's my intense human concern that helps me to get over the boundaries of pure and impure folk. I do not believe in that rigidity of folklore, which is pure folk, oral, which is written in pure folk. I have tried to keep the human scene central in the cantos of this poem, Sita. The more I pay attention to the human world, the better the line between the lyric and the story begin to disappear. And anyway, in Indian poetry, there has never been a clear line between the classical and the folk. Always classical yes. literatures, folk literatures, they have exchanged hands. So Sita, a poem, it, it implies a person, a voice, a specific scene, a whole dramatic situation. 
first of all thank you ma'am for uh, you know introducing this folk literature to you know ma english because as you have already mentioned like in our courses in our syllabus we do not have a demarcation between what classical literature is and what folk literature is and i think in our, one of our conversations i have already told you that you know while reading torudas while teaching torudas sita you know i have given them the list of some of you know the contemporary sitas i mean how the character of sita has evolved and changed reconstructed uh, and you have also mentioned mentioned about various theories that are you know related to sita you have mentioned about the post cultural thing how the post modern or the post structuralism you know has affected you know the whole construct of sita now uh, my question to you is i mean you have been teaching english literature and your uh, in fact specialization is critical theory if i am not wrong so do you ever feel that uh, the theory overtakes your poetry i mean is your sita some sort of one to one correspondence between your poetry and the post modern theories yeah you know so okay i agree that the theory overtakes my poetry quite visibly so and uh, at places without any camouflage i don't even try to pretend that it's pure creative writing so very uh, openly theory and poetry they come together there is hardly a feeling of discontinuity if one has to switch to my poetry after reading uh, prose discourses of jose buco derrida lanjainas barthes if someone is reading those uh, critical theories and then coming back to my poetry uh, there will be a continuity sort of yeah so okay let me quote some lines from uh, this book sita that uh, in the in the introduction sita i have written somewhere that uh, forgetting and forgiving the two eternal qualities of any human being of sita in this context have they not been rather arbitrarily interpreted to the extent of being even misrepresented by the critics were these two qualities not being exploited by sita near and dear are we not forgetting what real sita's message to the society was you know sita was a bold progressive optimistic positive woman but in some of the ramayans she has been presented as a docile woman we have conveniently forgotten the real message of sita so here focus concept of counter memory you know mm -hmm. you have read the memory mm -hmm. straight away it has been translated into my literature so in the following lines from sita i'll just read a few lines from the poem uh, the new credo of reading absences and silences as sites uh, with meaning uh, to be redefined in a poetical form so here i can quote a couple of lines from uh, sita sita writes that uh, uh, so when she is away from uh, lord ram uh, how she distributes herself in the sitaness of many women she writes i am away from ram since ages but my eternal monologue continues i have been taking births and rebirths my thirst quenched my heart's passion is drenched i distribute myself into atoms into my rebirths in the sitaness of every woman sita eternally breathes i am reborn as mother teresa florence nightingale lucy gray helen of troy cleopatra atlanta cordelia Desdemona, Penelope, Sylvia Plath, Athena, Kunti, Draupadi, Gandhari, Shakuntala, Radha, Mirabai, Kalpana Chawla, Kiran Bedi, Indira, Nirvaya, Damini, Nandini, Revati, or Anandi. I have numerous lives in women, bold and beautiful. So contemporary theories of postmodernism and poststructuralism, you know, they provide me the paradigm, the basic paradigm of my creative output. and these theories deliver me the poetic design the metaphor and in fact a much a poetic person is she displays her postmodern attitude towards divine by way of juxtaposing it into purity pollution divet of the human mind so there is a situation when uh, sita uh, after the death of ravan sita was expecting lord ram to rush to her to get his lover his wife back to him but then ram he creates the political situation he instructs vivishan to hand over the queen sita to king ram so one king asking another king to hand over the political property sita 
back to him so here sita is asking so many questions to ram uh, you know about the purity uh, purity pollution debate in his mind so i have somehow theorized that under the post modern theory that god is a wishful narrative in the post modern theories an essentialized abstraction a metaphysical fiction so in my poetic universe too the divine as transcendental is implied as something nothing more than an exclusive imagination ram is just an imagination sita proposes her questions not at lord ram but her human husband ram so in the poetical disguise she writes that i smoldered with bitterness sullenness and said who are you expecting to adorn justice to a woman lakshman so lakshman is asking his brother brother please give justice to your wife so she is asking who are you expecting to adorn justice lakshman from the one who had discreetly forsaken his pregnant wife and put the responsibility on your shoulder to convey the essence of exile to her before 13 years from the father who didn't worry to inquire if his offspring saw the light of the day safe and sound from the husband who left his beloved wife at the mercy of wild animals in the forest when she was at her most vulnerable state even to stand up and protect herself from the responsible father who did not ever care to know if his royal sons became beggars or mendicants i janaki the mother of love kush demand justice today from the noblest king on earth for the wrong done to a pregnant woman and her unborn children and justice for the fatherless teens if justice cannot be given what right the king has got to adorn the throne aren't his queen and children a part of his subjects deserting three innocent people is it called honorable ethics o lakshman as a citizen do i too have some fundamental rights so sita is asking about her fundamental right yes. and she is in in ram rajya you are the harbinger of the earth's redemption o ram so what if your wife was sacrificed in the noble progression so to be, to get ram rajya wife and children were sacrificed and she is openly questioning this to the man ram and not to lord ram so basically you have actually deconstructed the character of sita i mean uh, bringing it from the status as a religious doctrine and you know brought it back to the realm of the myth which is uh, malleable to imagination now it actively encourages us to uh, make the story our own reminding us that you know ramayan can be ours as much as it was uh, valmiki's or tulsidas's and as we have mentioned about fuko and the reconstruction of history i mean uh, you know this melange of history and uh, reconstruction of myth uh, you know reminds me of you know fuko who underlines uh, the, the you know the need of you know study of history while creating our own present so how do you like to associate that with your sita the events of history as you know fuko said while creating our present okay thank you dr queen you know my aim is not to establish some easy one to one correspondence between my poetry and post modern theories mm -hmm. but if i try to do so it will be only hypothetical sita can only be a hypothetical text the beauty the enjoyment the aesthetics of sita will be lost if i try to have a one to one correspondence between theory and poetry in this so it is not necessary either i uh, try to verify and uh, create a new genre it is also not necessary to verify whether a poem was written prior to the publication of any particular book of theory or uh, or or the creative writing or the poetry book was published before the theory book it is a question of the relationship between the two possibilities the promises of theory and the opportunities of poetry so uh, in any given environment these two things are taken together the engagement between post modern theory and a poet of the university like me uh, it has an unjustified absolute negative tone in indian english poetry so nandini as a poet negotiates the apparently dissimilar pursuits of theory poetry and translation so there is some sort of in betweenness in me i am as much a poet of native sensibility as constructive poet of transformation or aporia the students have read about aporia and a reconstructive 
poet of translation you know for me theory and nativity they do not constitute any kind of binary i already told that they are counter hegemonic and if you like to look at the latest theories of deconstruction for me with uh, you know uh, these two things are polyphonic intertextuality plurality and polyphony are the big things happening in our literary scenario today so when you ask about uh, Foucault's uh, the events of history, so it is not a simple coincidence that Foucault also underlines the need to study the event of history. So it surprises, he talks about it, it's unsteady victories and unpalatable uh, defeats, he talks about those. The philosophical energy of uh, uh, these Sita poems once again come from Foucault's statement that a writer must be able to diagnose the illness of the body. The mind, its condition of weakness and strength, its breakdown and resistance, to be in a position to judge the philosophical discourse. So today morning only I was going through the Indian Express and I read an article uh, decoding feminism and intertextuality where the author, her name is Shel Jassen, so she has quoted Foucault uh, and the quotation is where there is power there is resistance and she talks clearly about the personal being the political. So Sita, my very personal Sita, she is actually my political ideology. And Sita's Satyagraha, her silent protest, her resistance, they are a part of my protest literature by receiving the events of history from the subaltern's perspective. The winner, the king, he writes history. History becomes immortal in books and temples. Now the loser or the so-called loser Sita, she's not actually the loser, but the so-called loser uh, becomes Sita a poem in the hands of poets like you and me and history is rewritten so Sita no more remains the subtext in the Ramayana Sita becomes the main character the protagonist okay. but ma'am uh, don't you think that Sita continues to exert a powerful influence on the collective Indian psyche I mean whether we talk about the subaltern literature or you know the politics behind the whole creation of Sita or uh, you know uh, we, we have always seen you know like uh, adjective like you know you know sacrifice self-denial unquestioning loyalty as some of the ideals which are always associated with the popular perception of Sita so do you think that you know uh, language plays a greater role especially when we are trying to recreate an epic character like Sita or we are when, whenever we are trying to change as you said that you know it's not a recreating a recreation of the Sita but you know you have deconstructed it so do you think that you know language plays a very vital role especially when we are dealing with myth yeah you know the choice of language is again a very uh, personal thing for any poet um, uh, in, in my case uh, somehow english has become my thinking language i have been comfortably writing in this language since uh, past 20 years or even more than that uh, so language is just a medium of expression and in case of the Indian English poet, uh, Indian English poets are quite happy and uh, satisfied to be an author as against a writer. Now you can ask me what's the difference between an author and a writer. You know, uh, an author, he moves, he or she moves within the orbit and theory and the language games. Language is a game, isn't it? So the yeah. other day, somebody, somebody told me that language is your behavior. Whatever you speak, so in your language is your behavior. So uh, the author plays the language games in moments of uh, the so-called creative liberations. There is nothing like creative liberation. We only use language as a camouflage uh, to, 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 to talk about that poetic liberty. So contemporary poets are conscious of their poetic pursuits and ends. Through long and extended prose introductions like this, like Sita has a very long introduction, you may go through that, and then through forwards, through interviews, like now we are having a discourse, a discussion about Sita. So through these things, you know, uh, the contemporary poets, they express their critical views on the issues of poetry theory and the symbiotic relationship between the poetry and the theory and their own poetic practices. See how much I'm talking about my own poetic practice in a, in a prosaic language. So these critical ideas become the background of their poetic output. Poetry begins to critique itself through poetry and the language game begins and it leads to poetic liberation so this is what i call poetic liberation a language game so creativity appropriates language 
we all appropriate our creativity through language and we appropriate language through creativity isn't it so poetry takes on a meta poetical game now meta narratives are the next big thing it becomes a poetry on poetry so poetry on poetry and this kind of meta discursive training is now common to all art forms including poetry now coming to me i am a self conscious poet and i take alternative to meta poetry to explain and understand the tricky questions of poetic process poetic diction and techniques so that is one essay by uh, the american scholar mark scholar technique as discovery so through the techniques a writer actually discovers himself or herself so through my techniques through blank verse free, free verse i discover myself for example my next book is titled as kern the character kern from mahabharat i am writing that book in the champu format champu is prose poetry and so the, it, the, there is something called champu tripadi saptapadi tripadi every third syllable will rhyme with each other saptapadi every seventh syllable okay. will rhyme with each other so i am using saptapadi because tripadi was practically impossible i really tried but rhyming every third syllable i really could not proceed beyond a point so i shift i switched over to saptapadi and this technique was discovery of myself when i am writing karna two things are actually challenging for me because masculinity studies from gender i have taken masculinity studies and i am thinking like a man i am thinking like karn would think about himself and i am writing in the first person narrative as karn so masculinity studies as a challenge and saptapadi of champu as a challenge so these two techniques techniques i have used as discovery of myself similarly in sita also i have used technique as discovery and the technique of language i have used a uh, very tricky language here and there so uh, and the, the first draft i wrote in an emotional mood in fact uh, when sita was trying to go back to mother earth when i was writing that canto i wrote that at 3 am in the night and i was practically crying i was shedding tears so that was an emotional first draft but the second and third draft when i edited the poem i i played the language game i tried to play around with words and i edited here and there so that is how i appropriated some part through language uh, so ma'am you know as you said so many things about language creativity language as behavior and again this appropriation part uh, true that you know uh, mythology mythological characters and myths have informed uh, you know talking about women's writing you know here i'm uh, trying to take uh, you know uh, a point into you know the, the gender discourse part as i have already mentioned this course you know we have seen that you know these things uh, from the second half of the 20th century in fact uh, one witnessed a uh, registering of protest and uh, you know contrary op- opinions almost unbashedly contemporary writings of uh, by women you know uh, uh, have heralded a different wave of communication for and with women and they not only create strong characters but also explore you know the contours of literary definitions beyond limits and as you said that you know you have used various poetic forms in order to give voice to different characters i mean it also reminds me of uh, kartika nayak until the lines where she has used uh, various poetic forms like rhymes as all of us uh, spanish gloss uh, in order to uh, you know each uh, poetic form actually highlights the characters the narratives of those characters uh, you know but uh, you know while exploring mythology i mean uh, we have always seen a kind of a political struggle uh, with the language especially when it comes to women writing or women taking over uh, women characters from the epic so uh, w- what are your views on uh, gender discourse especially when you are writing sita or when you know you are about to begin karna uh, how does gender discourse or how this language i mean uh, whether it comes as a barrier to you or you think that you know it has given you uh, new sights to unfold the various ideas how you see you know the gender discourse the whole power relationship uh, while writing uh, characters especially the women characters you know uh, only a person with uh, gender consciousness can write or read sita kind of a book when i take my theory classes uh, for our ma or mphil or phd students uh, when i take gender studies i tell them uh, one thing very clearly that gender studies is incomplete unless 
you are reading it in a three dimensional way one is feminism you have to read feminism and then next is masculinity studies men's studies which is rather a recent uh, area of research in pedagogy and next is queer studies lgbtq or the queer studies so you have to study these three parallelly balancing these three no none of these three is a rejoinder to the other one none of these three is actually uh, dependent on the other rather they are complementary to each other so when i wrote sita gender and gender studies definitely came to my mind in the making of lord ram the maryada purushottam what role sita had played so when i talked about masculinity studies that question came to my mind and in the making of sita or sita the mother sita the eco feminist the single mother someone who had the courage and conviction to groom her children all alone in the forest uh, in the making of sita what role lord ram had played so these things are complementary to each other and uh, writing demands a vertical division of our consciousness the self at war and the self in an acceptance mode sometimes i was in an acceptance mode sometimes i was at war with myself before writing this poem so this was my fertile site and the creative possibility before i wrote sita sita is my alternative feminism i told you that she is my alternative feminism through this text i aim at a kind of female bonding if you read the last canto she is talking a lot about sisterhood she is yes. giving messages to women right. and then she is questioning lord ram that because i had some spiritual power because i am a very powerful woman so ravan could not touch me i just put a grass piece of grass between me and ravan and he could not cross that but in my next birth if i am nirvaya and i am gang raped in a bus then i am not sita in my next birth who can actually check ravan so if her body is violated do you think that we should be throwing her in fact we should be accepting her so she poses such questions to the entire society so this is my contribution to gender uh, through sita that creating sisterhood solidarity female bonding and gender equality i aim at these four five things through this text so in the last part i am asking all women not to feel guilty if something wrong happens to them and in fact to face it boldly and i am asking all men that if something wrong happens to a woman to any sita in your life you should rather support her because all women men not have the power like sita to put a grass between herself and ravan ravan and check the inevitable so i am only trying to create gender equality gender parity through this text and it's a text of sisterhood so uh, before uh, i mean rather than talking theoretically because i think i talked a lot of theory rather than talking theoretically about gender do you allow me to read a couple of lines from it right from right i'm sure 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 ma'am we will be very happy okay so uh, in the beginning in the in the canto one uh, what sita says uh, call her what you may call her what you may sita janaki vaidehi rama she is woman she is every woman the propagated interpolated role model the woman who adopted a self in post exile the woman whom time and again patriarchy finds safe to evict in her emancipated consciousness but she has never been reticent never given up come back she has from the segments of mother earth to live in me me in you in the mass consciousness of the universe she is there till the commencement of a timeless history since the unwritten agenda of the society prevails to define me you in her altered forms sita dwells in the sitapurs rampurs udaipurs of india she is on the internet in tv soaps in households streets call centers universities in temples and churches in ceylon in the backwaters of kerala in your concealed perception and in the indian constitution she is 
the erstwhile women prime minister of india and the women president the multitasking working mother and the homemaker the gang raped girl in the delhi bus at night and the battered baby girl in the aims trauma center she is in the hot helpless tears of the poor in the hidden fears yet again she is the confident adamant stalwart new woman resilient as the pegasus so this is how i have defined uh, the character sita the deconstructed sita so i find sita in me as well as you thank you so much ma'am and uh, i mean your sita i think is uh, everywhere i mean uh, the way we have you have defined uh, you know her characteristic the way you have defined her i mean we find uh, a glimpse of sita i mean uh, i think in every woman whether it's you me or anyone i mean while reading your poem we can actually feel that connect and with this we come towards you know the end of this session and i hope that you Sita goes beyond levels to become a dynamic, strong-minded woman who doesn't give up. So, thank you so much, ma'am, for you know joining us today. And this session was really very wonderful. And I, I believe, and I, I firmly believe that you know my students, my Rashi University students, are going to love this session because they have already read your poems. And uh, with this discussion, they will have uh, you know lots of doubts. I think you know uh, has got cleared. So, thank you so much, ma'am. and uh, since you know you are here i mean uh, i'd request you if you can read just one of your favorite poems so that you know otherwise this session would be incomplete so just one uh, of your favorite poems and then we can sign off yeah fine so uh, we will conclude the session with a few favorite lines from uh, canto 24 uh, since this is a discussion only on sita so i would just read a few lines from that but before that i must thank you dr queen for asking me such sensible and such sensitive questions and making the discussion so interactive and so beautiful thanks to you thank you thank you the pleasure is all mine ma'am thank you so much i really enjoyed my interaction with you so with that uh, i will just conclude with a few lines from uh, page 111 of uh, the text sita you ask me nandini yes. or ask sita the woman or you ask dr queen what do you feel about yourself how do you perceive yourself the answer would be i am prakriti born of and fading into mad nature i am shakti phenomenal destroyer of ravan i am grace i stand for mercy bounty and redemption i am the ultimate woman the glorious mother of love kush i am nature i have inestimable moods and assortments i am flower i have innumerable appearances on earth i am splendor i transcend the crimson womanly i am pure bliss i float as foam on the sea of frenzy i am innocence born naked from the furrow i am a tear drop i stand for the morning mortality i am a bird grasped and fluttered to withdrawn regions i am innocence i am i am a memory sweltering and reverberating time and again i am birth my girlhood is joyous with simmering intimations i am growth i burn in the flame of the fire ordeal i am death i overpower ravan i eclipse evil i am immaculate i have the attitude for the tide of sovereignty i am mighty my power lies in ultimate motherhood i am divine my love and grace redeem the universe i am human i suffer like any mortal ever is i am benevolence let them admire my compassionate pedigree i am malevolence i care no worth no bond is no death thank you so much ma'am thank you so much ma'am thank you for being here so with this we are signing off